This is Ed Kyle of Mike LaHood. Today on our program, we're taking hacks with Dr. Brian Sikowski. Dr. Sikowski is a sole practitioner at Jersey Shore Sports Medicine with offices in Summers Point and Winoka Harbor, New Jersey. Dr. Brian, welcome to the program. Would you start off by giving us a little background about yourself and your practice? Sure, thanks for having me. Um, you, I've, I've noticed you guys have developed quite a following, so I'm excited to talk to both of you and, and all of your fans. Um, I am a, a sports medicine physician. Uh, I do only non-surgical treatments. I have a practice here in Summers Point, Jersey Shore Sports Medicine. Um, I'm a local guy, I grew up in Margate, uh, Lang City High School, uh, Rutgers University, went through all my medical training, South Jersey, Philadelphia, a year in Cleveland. Came back 11 years ago and worked for the Rothman Institute for five years. Then after that, decided that I wanted to uh, practice on my own and have a little bit more flexibility in how I treated patients. So I opened up Jersey Shore Sports Medicine, uh, spent two years in Ocean City, and the last four years here in Summers Point. Great. I, I think that's going to set a good foundation for the, for the conversation because like, I'm going to lead right in with what we got. Lots of reports mm -hmm. in the news about injuries mm -hmm. in youth sports. And they're mm -hmm. not necessarily the ones that are happening on the field with two players colliding or things like that. You know, physical, traumatic, on-field stuff. We start to hear now a lot about this new word, overuse. Can you talk about that? What is it? What, is there preventatives for it? Uh, you know. Yeah, absolutely. When you talk about baseball, baseball is one of the sports where there's a lot less contact than sports like football or basketball. So most of the injuries are non-contact injuries. And obviously anybody that's played baseball knows the majority of the injuries are related to the arm, whether it's the shoulder, the elbow, sometimes the wrist. Um, so when we talk about overuse injuries, the, the structures that stabilize the joints and we'll focus primarily on the shoulder and the elbow are either muscles and tendons or ligaments. And so they're soft tissue and they get put under a lot of stress, particularly with the throwing motion. So instead of a fall or a twist where you feel where something tears, instead it's a, an accumulation of stress on the tissue that ends up causing the tissue to start breaking down. And you get that, uh, you hear that horrible word, inflammation. Um, and so the, those tissues get inflamed and you hear, you hear different um, terminology, but the word always ends in itis, whether it's tendonitis or apicondylitis or bursitis. Itis means inflammation, and when the inflammation takes over and the soft tissue can't heal itself, that's when you get the, these overuse injuries, and it's exactly what it sounds like. The structure's being used too frequently and can't heal itself and starts getting damaged. Yeah, yeah that's, um, <clears throat> that, that, that's very accurate on our end, too. It ties into what you're talking about. And... Um, Brian, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, we appreciate your time. I know you're busy, and uh, we appreciate you coming on board. Um, so, on our end, you know, we, we see we see it too. We we recognize the elbow. I mean, we don't we don't identify the exact injury, but we see we we identify elbow or shoulder right right away. You know, the kids, their arm angle drops, their velocity drops. Not that we're big velocity people here, but uh, you know, it's it is important. It does play a role. Um, but there, to me, it's more of an indicator of something's going on. And, um, you know, and you had mentioned in your intro that you're a non, basically if people caught it, you're a non-surgical uh, physician, which, um, you know, I think is a big advantage um, to go to somebody that m might look at other ways of treatment that, that can um, take care of the problem, probably in less time, meaning more specifically, um, um, less time on the shelf or recuperating. Um, what would be, so everyone has a, a general idea. I mean, we all think PT right off the bat, but I know for a fact with you, at least it's a lot more than that. What are some of these alternative type of, um, modalities that we can use for these types of injuries? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we talk about, um, how, how, how do we get them back to playing and how do we heal the injury? The number one factor is determining what exactly caused the injury in the first place? And that I think is where a lot of times that question where it sounds obvious is missed, particularly, you know, a lot of doctors that have high volume practices, they don't have a lot of time to spend with the patient and they just say, oh, it's, you know, it's tendonitis, um, take a couple of weeks off and you'll be fine. If there's an underlying mechanical issue, whether it's a weakness in a muscle or tightness in a, in a joint, 
that might be what's causing the structure to be overused. And so the number one, before we even talk about fixing the problem, we have to know what the problem is. And so in baseball, the, the, the kinetic chain and the, a lot of the power is developed from the legs and the power has to go from the legs through the torso and then down the arm. And if, if there's a problem anywhere along that chain, the arm's gonna pick up the slack and start overworking and then you end up with these overuse injuries. So the first step is finding the problem, the source of the problem. And then we can talk about fixing it. Uh, and when we talk about fixing it, physical therapy is probably the most frequent tool that I, that I use um, because we need to make sure the, the, the f flexibility and strength is there to return to play. But there are also some soft tissue treatments, some, something called active release technique, where for lack of a better description, it's, it's kind of like a, an anatomic deep tissue massage. So if there's um, structures that are stuck together or tight, loosening them, those up uh, manually uh, is, is another treatment option. Um, there's something called um, a blood flow restriction therapy is another way to help develop strength in the extremities, whether it's the legs or the, or the arm. Um, and then there's, you know, traditional medications where I'm not a big fan of oral medications like Advil or ibuprofen because they have a lot of side effects, but there are some topical creams that we can use in their place um, for targeted areas, particularly the elbow that has, that's uh, pretty superficial and the structures are close to the skin. So the medicine can be absorbed through the skin and we can avoid a lot of the side effects of pills. Um, so those are just a few of the options that we have when it comes to, to treating these types of overuse injuries. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, we're aware of some of them, I think, but I don't think the masses of us, you know, coaches, parents and alike, and of course the players are at young age, I don't think they realize there's more, a lot more, well, a significant amount of other options other than, you know, going, going under the knife, as they say, or physical therapy. I think sometimes we get caught up thinking that's all that there is. And, you know, return to the field is a big thing for any ball player. If, if no other reason, just because that's what they want to do. They want to play baseball, you know, and, and some kids are looking for opportunities. There could be an opportunity lost, you know, for, for being up on the shelf for too long. So that's real important. And, you know, I, I mentioned, I, I identify that in a major league level as well. And you see where the slight tears, I guess the tear really indicates in surgery or not, how big, you know, and you see the slight tears or the small tears, or whatever the right vernacular for that is, they're not, they're not going under knife on the right. They're not jumping into a Tommy John type mm -hmm. situation if it is the UCL, you know, and you see that with um, Tanaka from the Yankees. You know, he, he two couple of years ago, he, he got a slight tear in his elbow. Everybody said he's going to be out for 18 months because he needs Tommy John. And his doctors decided to not. And they treated it with some of these alternative uh, opportunities that you're talking about. And boom, he's back to new and hasn't looked back since. I hope I just didn't jinx him. But, um, <laughs> you know, so they, there are they're not just things to try. They're, they're proven to be successful. Am I correct? Yeah, and you touched on a couple of important things there that I kind of want to circle back on. And the first is um, the, the um, nomenclature is very important. So a lot of times you go to the doctor, you get an MRI, and as soon as someone hears the word tear, they, just, they automatically assume surgery and their brain kind of shuts down and doesn't listen to the context of the term. So complete tears. So when you talk about a tendon or a ligament, you, if you picture them like a rope, a complete tear is the rope is completely cut. Mm -hmm. The two ends are separated from each other. Those almost all the time need surgery. On rare occasions, we can, we can kind of work around it, but usually you're talking surgery. But the vast majority of tears that you hear about are partial tears. So maybe some of the fibers of the rope are, are torn, but the rope as a whole is still attached. And so those partial tears are, are, are injuries that we can oftentimes avoid surgery. And so there are some uh, techniques called regenerative medication or regenerative treatments um, that can be used to actually heal those partial tears because partial tears generally don't heal on their own. The, the tendons and the ligaments don't have the blood supply necessary to fix themselves. So by injecting these different substances, and I'll go through what they are in a second, 
but going injecting those substances into and around the torn tendon or ligament allows the body to actually heal the ligament uh, and get back to uh, pretty much full strength. So a lot of people have heard about stem cells. They're very popular in, in, in the literature and in the, in the media right now. Uh, so they're one way that we can heal an injury, but another more common way for partial tears, um, particularly in our younger population, is something called platelet-rich plasma injection. Platelet-rich plasma injection basically is where we draw the athlete's blood, we spin it down and concentrate the platelets in a, in a centrifuge. So the blood gets spun down, platelets separate to the top, the rest of the components of the blood separate to the bottom. And we take that plasma that has the platelets and we inject that into the tendons or the ligament. And the reason that works is because the platelets, besides having factors to stop bleeding, also has a lot of growth factors to stimulate healing of whatever the damaged tissue is. So now we're injecting a concentration of growth factors that the body can use to actually heal the tissue. So when you talk about a partial rotator cuff tear or a partial UCL tear um, or the Tommy John ligament or chronic tendonitis of the flexor tendon, so the, the tendons that attach to the inside part next to the Tommy John ligament, uh, those are all structures that can be healed if not completely torn, they can be healed with injections rather than surgery. And in doing so, you can cut the recovery time almost in half, in some cases even more, and get them back on the field quicker. Wow. And I'm assuming, because obviously you have a very in-depth knowledge of this procedure, doesn't, does it not have a, a nickname like PRP or something like that? Or? Yeah. So platelet-rich plasma, PR, uh, PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. So a lot of times you'll hear it referred to as PRP. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually think that's one of the procedures that Tanaka um, received. So obviously we know on at least on that level, it's verified fact that it works. So um, what I'm leading to when I ask you, obviously you're very versed on this. It sounds like this is something that you can do. That's one of your options, correct? Yeah. And it's a, it, the nice part is it's an in-office procedure. So I can do it right in my office in Summers Point. Doesn't, you don't need a surgical center. You don't need any um, significant anesthesia. We use a little bit of local lidocaine around the area that we're injecting. Um, it's a pretty rapid procedure. I mean, it takes five minutes to spin down the blood. Um, I have ultrasound in my office so that I can uh, find the, the exact point that I want to inject and use the ultrasound to guide the needle right into the tissue that I want to inject uh, if necessary. Uh, and it's done right here in the office and it's usually less than a 20, 25 minute procedure. Wow, that's great, that's great. And I guess, you know, mm -hmm. you do have people out there listening and, you know, moms, you know, moms look at all angles that some of us dads don't look at. Um, you know, like you got guys like Ed, they cry real easy. Is it painful <laughs> or? <laughs> um, it's not bad, I mean, it's not bad. I mean, look, there, there's a needle involved, so there's gonna be some discomfort. Um, and depending on where we're injecting, um, the elbow and the shoulder tend not to be too bad. Um, I've injected uh, athletes Achilles tendon or plantar fascia. So when you start working around the foot, that gets to be a little bit more painful. Um, but it's 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 pretty quick. So even though it's uncomfortable, and we do use lidocaine to numb it up, um, it, there is some discomfort, but nothing to nothing to be over, overly stressed about. E okay. Even Ed would survive it. That's great. I'm I'm sure Ed feels much better now. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to know that because yeah. surgery is not really a thing for me. So. <laughs> I just don't want him to be afraid to not throw BP now. So he's good to go. So that's good. Um, Absolutely. Let, let me just, if I can, let me, let me not double back, but digress a little bit. Cause we're talking about the other side, which is treatment. Um, from a coaching standpoint, it's very important to me and I'm sure any, any coaches that might be listening out there. And of course, to all parents, this is important. Um, could this be, Almost these types of injury, you, you mentioned before, strengthening the core, you know, the kinetic chain, the power, the, the energy starts at the bottom and it ends up coming out your arm. Um, can this be a mechanical deficiency too that's causing this, this increase all of a sudden? That, I mean, it's the most I've ever seen and I've been doing this for quite a while. Sure. So, I mean, there are two factors that, that are playing into the increase in overuse injuries and not just the increase, but also the younger ages. I mean, this used to be an issue um, college professionals and then into adults. Now we're seeing 10, 11 year olds develop these types of overuse injuries that didn't really happen before. So there are really two causes. Number one is, like you said, there, uh, 
a lot of times there's some type of mechanical deficiency, whether it's a pure technique issue and they're not, you know, they're not throwing properly. They're not using their legs. They're not, you know, bringing their arm all the way over the top and they're dropping their arm down. Uh, that's one, that's one source for it. Um, another, the other part of it is there's likely a weakness somewhere along that chain that's causing things to break down. And then the second part is the, the volume of participate or the volume of activity. And, you know, when I was growing up, baseball was a six month sport. You played in the spring, you had little league, and then maybe you had some travel teams in the summer. Um, and then come fall, you played football, you played soccer, you played basketball. You, we would bounce around different sports, different times of the year. Nowadays, younger and younger kids are specializing in one sport and playing that sport year round. And the bot, their body, nobody's body is built to play one sport 12 months out of the year, year after year. And so that's when their structures start breaking down and they get the overuse injuries. Um, so I recommend for all, for all of my athletes, regardless of, uh, regardless of the sport, to take at least two months off. So in baseball, that's armrest. You know, they, they should take at least two months and not throw, at least not throw significantly. If they want to have a light toss with their friends, that's fine. But they shouldn't be really pitching or long tossing or any of that stuff for at least two months to let their body heal. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. We, we follow a similar protocol to, to that um, with our players. And of course, they, they can do what they want on their own. I mean, that's obviously their option. But we, we try to at least let them understand that, you know, try to stay the hard throw. And that's why we don't even start our winter workouts to January for part of that reason. Let's make the body strong for a couple months and then we'll get back into baseball activity. Um, so I think a good and then we'll move on to another point because I, I, I don't want to under 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 speak about this. I don't know if that's good English, but I think you know what I mean. Um, because this is very important. It's it's the central thing. It's a central issue that's just going on, and we all deal with it. Parents, well, I mean, coaches, doctors. Um, so what, what I was going to ask, and then you can answer it and add whatever you want. A lot of these kids, because you had mentioned it's, it's, it's almost become difficult to be a three-sport um, athlete anymore. Um, and, you know, whether I agree or disagree with that doesn't matter. It's not the point. Um, they, they go out and they get instructors. Like we had Cesar Garcia on last week. I know you know who he is. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's you know, a, a big time pitching instructor. So it's important to whoever you go to that they're not just teaching you how to throw hard. You know, let's just get up there, throw as hard as you can and, you know, strike everybody out. But there's, there's a, a mechanical thing as far as technique that should be addressed in these processes when they're looking for the right guy, let's say, for them to work with their kids pitching, but more importantly, their kid's arm, which ultimately equals their future if they're going to have one. Would that be something that you would suggest? And overuse is not just something that we're seeing in baseball. We're seeing it across the board in, in virtually every sport mm -hmm. and at a younger age. So it's something that's becoming, you know, you, you see some people using the term epidemic in youth sports, and it's yeah. something that we're focusing on across the country at all levels of um, organization on, on the sports medicine side, both surgical and non-surgical, um, looking at ways that we can prevent a lot of these overuse injuries because they are preventable. And one of the ways we, we can do that, besides just saying, you know what, take a break, shut it down, do something else for a couple months, is like you said, teaching proper technique. So I did catch the podcast with uh, Caesar last week. And he had a lot of great information, not just from a technique standpoint, how to pitch, but how to keep the arm healthy and be able to stay on the field. Um, so that, that was a lot of valuable information. But the best time to teach proper technique is when, when the kids are young. That's the time that they really need the, co the proper coaching. And unfortunately, when you're looking at Little League and, and T-ball, it's mostly, you know, T-ball may be a little young, but you're mostly looking at parents who sure, maybe they probably played baseball when they were younger, but the parents are the ones stuck teaching the technique and they may not have all of the technique prop, you know, fully down. But when you're young, your mind's open and you can learn the, the proper movements. As you get older, you start falling into bad habits and those bad habits get imprinted into the brain. And then if you're trying to fix technique in a high schooler versus an 11 year old, it's going to be a lot harder to fix that, that flaw because it's been, repeated so many times it's it's ingrained in their movement and now you have to break that down and build it back up 
So getting coaches at a younger age that can teach them proper technique, that's more important than, you know, what velocity are they throwing or, you know, how much, how, how much weight are they lifting? It, technique is, is key when they're young and the rest of the stuff will come as they develop. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I, I think we, we pretty much covered it now. I, I just, <clears throat> just a couple of things just because we're around it, you know, I'm no expert by any means, but we're around it. We see what happens. We see the injuries. And I just wanted to make sure we touched, let's just call it all four corners, if you will, of, of, of this discussion before moving on, because I think that's a lot of why people are jumping on here today to, to listen to you and, and hear what you have to say, because this is the knowledge that they need and this is what they're looking for. So um, I think we covered that pretty well. Is there anything else in that along those lines that you want to add or? No, I think, I think that pretty much covers it. I mean, if, if I had my druthers, everybody would be, would be playing, every kid would be playing multiple sports because of the development that it allows for different muscle groups and different skills and different coordination that I feel like they become better athletes by playing multiple sports. Unfortunately, the way things are and development wise and looking for that college scholarship, they have to specialize to keep up with the other kids in their age group. I, yeah. I really think that's a, a fact of life, but it would be nice if they could if they could spend time developing other skills. Yeah, yeah. You know, <clears throat> like I said earlier on, I don't want <clears throat> to get too deep in what I agree and don't agree with, but you know, I hear you. I think there should I would like to think that there's a way that we could control the overlapping as drastic as it is, but again, it's, it's comes down to letting people do what they want to do. You know, absolutely. I'll never tell a parent how to parent their child and make decisions. So, you know, they look at things, everyone has a different perspective. So, um, you know, as long as they get good information and use it correctly, I think that's important. And that's about as best as we can do from our side. So, um, with that being said, let's let's move on and let's talk about something else that might not be as bad as far as um, injury. I don't even know if it would be an injury, but, um, you know, causing downtime or whatnot. But to me, it's absolutely as important, um, especially with travel, when you get into travel ball, you know, high school season anymore, it's really crazy. It's like football season. It's freezing cold for the first half of the season. And then, you know, it's not too bad towards the end. But once you hit, the, you know, get on, if they've got those who play travel, you're playing in 98, 99, 100 degree weather, you know, some games are on turf and then a lot of games are on turf. We played a lot of colleges and, you know, it's 130 on the turf. And I see kids, you know, which boggles my mind, but now I have a better understanding. They're gassing out in warm-ups, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, you know, what's going on here? You know, and they, yeah. coach, I'm my head. I don't feel good. And then, of course, I say, did you eat? Well, no, or I ate a Hot Pocket, you know, something, something like that. And, uh, well, did you hydrate? Well, yeah, I, I, had a glass, I had a glass of water this morning when I brushed my teeth, and we didn't have enough time to stop at Wawa because we were running late. So yeah. I know, and I think people need to hear from someone with your type of background and, and the way you can explain it. <clears throat> Talk to us about hydration. And, and nutrition, especially in a tournament format, because it's a little bit more um, taxing on the body than playing, you know, one game on Tuesday, one game on Thursday. I mean, you could play, if you're decent or you're having a good tournament, you could play five games in three days. Sure. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, when we talk about hydration, the, the first thing everyone thinks about and they picture are the, is cramping. Um, so, you know, oh, you got to drink because you don't want to cramp up. And that's definitely true. But by the time you start cramping up, you're way, way behind and you're not catching up anytime and, and that day, maybe for the next day, but you're way behind. But not only from a, from a cramping standpoint, but just from a uh, performance standpoint, hydration is vital. As you start getting dehydrated, your performance decreases. You're a step slower. You're not, you, you know, you probably lose a couple, couple miles per hour on your fastball as a pitcher, your, you know, your reaction time's a bit slower. So, you know, in, in that kind of heat, hydration is vital. So, so then the question becomes, how do we stay hydrated? What is there some type of formula? And the, the reality is hydration, especially for weekend tournaments, hydration should be a focus throughout the week. I mean, you want to make sure you're drinking 64 ounces of water a day, every day, during the week so that you're starting fully tanked up. The day before the tournament, you might wanna have an extra 24 ounces of water to really make sure the tank's full before you, before you even leave for the tournament. 
And then once, once, once play has started, you know, the formula states, you know, about six ounces of, of fluid for every 15 minutes of activity in the heat. Now, look, I've played a lot of sports and I've been, I've been, I've worked out in heat before. I don't know anyone that drinks that much, but that's the formula that's recommended. So you can see how much you should be drinking and how easily it can be, it can be to, to, to get dehydrated pretty quickly. So having some type of, uh, of uh, water on the bench or some t- something on the bench to keep the players hydrated is vital. And afterwards, the best way to figure out how much you need to drink after a game or at the end of the day is if you have a scale. So if you weigh all of your players before the, tor- before the day starts and then at the end of the day, whatever weight they've lost is water weight. And that needs to be replaced before, before the next day and they start all over again. So general rule of thumb is anywhere from 12 to 24 ounces, or to make it easy, a bottle of water for every pound that you've lost during the course of the day. Wow. Wow. It almost sounds daunting when you put it into those terms, but I mean, your body will take it because it needs it. It's not like you're asking the body to do something that it's not ready for. Um, so um, that, that makes a lot of sense. Now you talked I found it very interesting listening to your answer. I thought for sure that I was going to hear, you know, a couple other liquids. Uh, I'm trying to stay away from brand names. Uh, other liquids that you see that are prevalent in the dugout. And you're pretty much stuck with water. So let me just throw it out there and then you can answer it in any way that you see fit, obviously. Um, I, I think sport drink is the proper way of what I'm trying to say. You yeah. didn't mention sport drinks. You didn't min- mention, I mean, you can't watch a major league game anymore and not have a shot in the dugout in the summertime when they've got a bottle of water, but it's obviously not water. It's colored. They're mixing it up and drinking it. And um, I know for a fact that it's, what do they call them? I, I know we've had this conversation before, BCAs or something like that. Oh, um, b- a branch chain amino acids, so BCAAs. Acid, yeah. It's very big at that level. And then there's a lot of people that go old school and they're drinking chocolate milk. Um, you know, so I don't know. I know that was big when I was young because none of the other things existed or if it did, we didn't know about it. Right. Um, so was there a reason why you didn't mention them or? Yeah. I mean, there are some products out there that are, that are okay. Um, but the, my, my biggest pet peeve with most of the sports drinks are they're just packed with sugar and you don't need that much sugar. Um, the electrolytes are important, the sodium, the potassium, the magnesium, those types of things are important to replenish. But most of these sports drinks are packed with just plain old sugar, makes them taste good, but it doesn't help the body in any way. If anything, you drink a whole bunch of these sports drinks, you you crank your sugar up and an hour or two later, you're going to crash because your body's burned through all that sugar. And now it's looking for more. Um, So I don't think it's all that healthy. Plus, you know, there's a lot of chemicals and a lot of artificial sweeteners and a lot of artificial junk in a lot of those um, drinks and packets and, and powders that, you know, the body doesn't really know what to do with. So when in doubt, I, I like to stick with water. Like I said, I'm sure there are some individual products out there that are good and safe, but for, for, when, for painting with a broad brush, so to speak, it's just safer to stick with water. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just a curiosity, and I know other people have asked me this as well, even some of my players. What is the deal with chocolate milk? Why would that be a thing? What is that? Well, chocolate milk has some natural sugars. So unlike, you know, the sports drinks that put put um, just plain old, you know, sugar like you get at it, you know, you, like you put in coffee, um, chocolate milk has, uh, or particularly milk in general, has lactose, which is a natural sugar that the body breaks down and utilizes. Um, there's some protein in, cho- in, in milk that you don't get in, in most of the sports drinks. So there are some um, natural nutrients that you get in milk that you don't necessarily get in plain water or sports drinks. Okay. All right. So that's where the chocolate comes in. And then. the chocolate's a lot more palatable than just drinking, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, I just, a certain I just, movie I just, where the, guy, where yeah, the guy's yeah, walking yeah. down the street th- drinking a, qu- a quart of milk. Yeah, and the heat, not such a good, not well, such a good choice. Well, see, that's I get, I have visions of hot weather curdling in my stomach. Why am I doing this thing? I mean, so yeah, even chocolate milk. You want to make sure it stays cold. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's interesting. That, that, that's really good information. And, you know, one more thing on this, too, because it does pertain to what these kids do, because a lot of people don't realize, um, I don't want to try to sound corny here or make something a bigger deal than what it is, but playing tournament baseball is, is, is it's almost like a learned, it's almost an art to it because there's so many variables that go through the course of a Saturday, a Sunday, and if it's a longer five-day tournament, you know, we touched on a lot of it right now. You know, you told us what to do before a game, how far in advance before a game. You told us a little bit what to do after a game. How about in between games? Like, say we we just played a game. We've got an hour and a half sit before our next game, and everyone's hungry because they haven't eaten since breakfast. You know, what's what's an ideal meal for in between games so you don't come back dragging ass? So that's a great question, and, and you know, the, that – that also brings up a, a larger topic, which, which maybe we'll have time to touch on, maybe not, but, and that's nutrition in general. But when you look at gaps in between, game, in between games, um, you're, you wanna find a meal that has a combination of, of carbohydrates, preferably um, whole grain carbohydrates, so they're a little bit slower to break down, some protein, again, so it breaks down slowly over the course of a couple hours so that they don't feel full for that hour and a half. And just as they're ready to go on the field, they're hungry all over again. So, you know, peanut butter sandwiches are great. You know, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are a great, um, easy snack to, to have, particularly on whole wheat bread. Um, that's a good way to go. Having some type of um, at snack food that has nuts in it, like almonds or, or, or walnuts. Um, again, healthy fats, protein, um, that will that the body will break down slowly and keep them full and energized throughout the next few hours, both covering the break in between games and carry them through the games, um, okay. through the next game. Yeah, that, that, that's great. I think that's a much needed missing piece because, look, I'll, I'll even admit it. I just tell my guys after the first game, we pull them out behind the dugout and we talk and, you know, what to do to be ready for the next game. And I said, look, make sure you're eating the right way. That's it. I don't have nothing more for it. It's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and because when I hear you talk, here's the problem. I'm probably not the right guy. You said proteins and whole wheat. So I think I can have a very lean double cheeseburger on a whole wheat bun. So <laughs> that's not the advice I think I should be given though, right? No, I, 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 don't, I don't think that's an ideal pregame meal. <laughs> um, all right. Well, you know what? Is there anything else I'm missing on this point? The nutrition, you know, maybe not so much as it pertains to when we're actually getting ready and preparing for a game that's going to happen very in the very near future, that day, the next day, that weekend, whatever. Um, is there something, uh, a formula maybe? You've, 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 you've doled out a couple of good formulas that I know I can utilize for some of the things that we spoke about. As far as just normal three-day, uh, three-meal-a-day type approach to being an athlete um is that something that is important as well not just when you're playing yeah so you know nutrition as a whole is is very important for for a couple for a couple perspectives obviously performance it's important you have to have the proper energy to um to to, to perform um but also injury so you know one of the things i've started to look more into as part of my practice is what does diet have to do with pain and inflammation. And so when you look at what kind of foods you eat, there are some certain uh, categories of foods that produce a lot of inflammation. So if you have one of these smoldering overuse injuries, you might be feeling more pain and getting or causing more inflammation in that injured tissue just with the foods you eat. So processed foods, food, you know, boxed foods, foods that have um, processed sugars or that are high, uh, sim high in simple carbs, those foods break down very easily. And the body, the way the body responds to that digestion is to create inflammation. Um, also things that have um, trans fats. So if you look at the ingredients, anything that says hydrogenated oils, those are artificially made to make them more stable. That's why food can sit on a shelf in a box or a bag for two, three, four years and be completely fine is because they've been artificially um, changed to make them more stable. Again, that becomes a foreign substance to the body and the body doesn't know how to process it. And that leads to inflammation. 
Uh, on the flip side, there are foods you can eat to bring inflammation down. There, you know, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, um, whole grain foods, foods with high in fiber tend to keep the body healthy um, and bring down inflammation. It might, you know, I'm not saying it's going to prevent injury, but there's a possibility it'll, it'll cause less pain so your injury doesn't hurt as much and maybe yeah. you can play through it. Yeah. Yeah, no, th th that, those are great points. Um, uh, you know what? I, I'm looking down at the clock, and I can't believe it seems like we just started, and we've covered a lot, <clears throat> and it's been 30-something minutes or close wow. to 30 minutes. And um, I, I think this is a lot of info for everybody out there. I, I mean, we could talk all day on this subject. I think it's so so much of an unknown that's so important. Um, and I think to grasp it, and this nice chunk right here would, would be a good point to leave of those who are paying attention out there and listening right now to, uh, to, 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 to chew on that, if you will, to, to use a cliche and, and, and get something out of that without just pouring more, you know, the old, uh, what's it called? Stimulation overload. I don't think we need to go to that point. So right. unless there's something that you want to add to any of the things <clears throat> that we've already spoken about, I think this will be a good point to just, you know, start shutting it down for, for, for the, for the night. And, uh, you know, and, and take this down to a wrap. So is there anything that maybe you want to circle back that you thought of that you should have said, but you didn't say? No, no, actually, I think we covered everything really well. The only thing I would say is that for everything we talked about for the kids, whether it's overuse injuries or nutrition, uh, particularly the treatments, like the regenerative treatments we talked about, you know, kids have parents and parents have injuries too, and parents are active. Um, and so everything I talked about here for the kids most of which translate can translate to the parents. And so if the parents have injuries or the parents have issues, you know, the, these types of treatments are good for them as well. So, you know, I, I treat all ages. So, but, you know, parents need to take care of themselves in addition to their kids. So, you know, it translates to that, to pretty much all age groups. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Our parents get hurt carrying their kids equipment. So um, <laughs> we have that problem, uh, but that's Only a whole younger other ones. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, so here's the thing. Now we're at that point where we're going to start shutting it down and you're going to lead us into it. You know, you know, you didn't know that. Um, we know that alternative to, to surgery, they're, they're, they're plentiful now. That's people that they should explore. I mean, way back to the beginning of time, they always tell you to get a couple opinions anyway. So, you know, obviously someone with a practice like yours, I would think is a no brainer to be part of, uh, of that process, you know, come see somebody who, who doesn't, perform surgery, um, who does have alternate types of um, treatments that could obviously the most important heal, but heal quicker. You know, it seems like in most cases, the return time, return to field time, which is a big important thing to people seems to be less. Um, so I, I, I think it's a good walk away for people to make sure that they understand, you know, that there, there are people, you know, that do pretty much what you do. But I know in this area, you're the man. Uh, there's not many that do all the things that you do and do it well. Because I know, I mean, I, I, I met you originally in my professional life. And I know, I mean, it seems like every weekend you're away learning something else. Um, you know, whether, you know, from all the way from the, the, at the top end of all these cutting edge type things, all the way down to, you know, um, uh, um, alternative type medicines, which I think is, is um, a real compliment to your, your commitment to try to help these young athletes out. So with that said, is there anything that you want to say, this is your time, you know, to talk about whatever you want, your, your practice or anything that maybe you want them to know about you that they don't know. Um, and you can, you can take it away and then we'll, I'll shut it down right after that. So yeah, I mean, firstly, I appreciate all the kind words. We, we, you know, we've known each other for a number of years, both on a, a professional and um, medical level, um, not to give away any patient confidentiality. Um, but, you know, the, the main goal of my practice, you know, I, I joke with patients all the time, but my, the whole purpose of my practice is to keep you off of the operating table. But what I think is somewhat unique about my practice this day and age is that I've specifically tailored it opposite the large groups that most people are accustomed to. So I keep, my, I keep my schedule light so I have plenty of time to spend with the patients, which gives me the time to do a, a thorough history 
a thorough physical examination where I know a lot of places doctors don't even touch their patients anymore. Um, I do a, a thorough physical examination and really take the time to di dr dig down into the and find the source of the problem, whether it's the body part they came in for or maybe it's somewhere else on their body. Um, but it's really, I take the time and develop a, a, a relationship with my patient and their families. Uh, and so, you know, it's just me seeing the patients. I have two staff members. So when you call, you're going to know someone, you're going to get a real person. You're not going to get uh, an automated message. And uh, we all, all, all of us in the office take the time to get to know mm -hmm. our patients and mm -hmm. develop a, a relationship mm -hmm. so that we can, mm -hmm. you know, get them feeling better as quickly as possible and for our athletes getting them back on the field as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I know you do that and I know that's your goal and I know you accomplish those goals uh, very well. And um, so that, that, that's, that's a great thing. And um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to shut this down. And once again, thank you for your time. Most definitely thank you for this unbelievable uh, amount of information on a lot of fronts that are so important to these young athletes. Uh, everyone, I think people need to hear this. And um, I'm glad you were able to, we were able to bring someone like you on to, to in this type of forum and, and, and share that knowledge. So once again, thank you so much. Um, it was great having you. I will see you soon um, or, or probably be talking to you even before I see you. Mm -hmm. And um, you have a good night and thanks for coming on board. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Skalski, for joining us today. Since we want to help keep our young athletes safe, we really appreciate your time and knowledge on the topics today. Join us next time when Matt Kress, pitching coach and recruiter from Bloomsburg University, speaks with us about one of the hottest topics on a student athlete's mind right now. How do I get recruited when my high school season is canceled and my summer season may be limited? Until then, from Michael Hood, I'm Ed Kyle, and we're Taking Hacks with New Jersey Baseball.